<laughs> Thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot, everyone. Uh, we keep the time. I see that it's time. It's uh, ten thirty now, and um, that means it's time for the first actual uh, point on our program for this festival. Uh, and we start our festival with a keynote lecture, uh, which I hope will light the spark for our conversations and reflections and discussions on environmental humanities for the days to come. Uh, uh, and I'm really, really happy and honored to welcome as our keynote speaker, one of the most profile scholars, I would say, on the field of environmental humanities in the Nordic, Nordic countries, Professor Dolly Jorgensen from the University of Stavanger in our neighboring country. Uh, I was about to say Oslo, no, no Norway, that's <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, Norway, that is. Uh, and Dolly is a professor of history, investigating more specifically the history of environment and, and of technologies. Uh, her academic curiosity uh, and attention, however, uh, covers quite a large period or chunk of time from contemporary concerns to medieval matters. And she approaches an analysis, various objects and events from science fiction television series to issues of rewilding and de-extinction, to name just a few of those matters. Uh, Moreover, she has also taken an interest in the methodological expansion and variations of academic practice today, offered, for example, by digital tools. But she is also, of course, the author and editor of printed objects, of printed books, journal issues, and essays. And most recently, uh, I want to mention then, uh, Visions of North in Pre-Modern Europe that was out this year, edited together with Virginia Langham. Uh, furthermore, she holds a number of positions of trust on the field of environmental humanities and was, for instance, the president of the European Society for Environmental History from 2013 to 2017. Uh, the promising and quite hopeful, I would say, title of Professor Jorgensen's lecture today is The Future of the Past or Making Room for New Natures. And with this, I want to once again welcome you so much, Dolly, and uh, to the Steve Box program. And please come up. Thank you very much um, for everyone for being here today. Um, and thank you very much uh, for the invitation to speak. Um, I'm very excited to come to Lens Shopping. I haven't been here before. Um, so we live in a world of rapid change. And it's not just that there are more people, more information, and more things than there ever have been before. It's that the, the rate of change, the steepness of the curve of change, has never been greater. So when we see graphs like the great acceleration curves, we should think not only about how high the number is, but how much steeper it is rising now than it has in the past. This means that the changes are noticeable and have been to people living since the beginning of industrialization. And these changes are not just quantitative, but qualitative as well. The world is a different world more quickly than it's ever been. Now, the impulse in the modern age, then, has often been to freeze parts of the world, to avoid this change and lose the past. So vast art gallery collections, listed historical houses, world heritage cathedrals, national parks are all part of the same desire to save what the modern world would change. The past is reified in these preserved human artifacts and natural landscapes. We know the past and we experience the past through them, yet as historian David Lowenthal, who passed away this last weekend, uh, has so well argued, to know is to care, to care is to use, to use is to transform the past. <coughs> 
So in our preservation of these things, we cannot help but make the old new, even if many do not recognize that's in fact what they're doing. Now, preservation is an extremely new idea in the history of humankind. If you look at medieval cathedrals, they did exactly the opposite. When a new tower was built, the one on the right, it was not designed with the existing architectural style of the structure, but in fact, what was up to date right then. What today looks like it was cobbled together was purposefully embracing the new. Many are skeptical now of this kind of updating. Instead, buildings are maintained or in fact restored to their condition at a set moment in time. Wilderness areas are supposed to remain without roads in order to keep their character. So this saving impulse can lead to a stagnation of the preserved item. And also, as, as William Cronin has argued in his critique of wilderness, a devaluing of those things which are not marked off as important enough to be saved. So you save what's in the boundaries of the fence and burn everything else to the ground. Now, Along with this, a declensionist narrative has been strong within the environmental movement from the 1970s onward. That this change, this rapid change we're experiencing, is all bad. The environment as a thing and our relationship as humans with the non-human world are made out to be worse than they ever have been in the past. And within, within the environmental movement, we see tendencies to decry the changes brought by industrialization, from critiquing energy supplies to synthetic materials to factory farming. Now, while many of these are well-placed arguments that should encourage us to reevaluate what we're doing and why we're doing it, I also see a trend to propose that we return to some imagined past. It's assumed to be possible and advisable to jettison capitalism or animal husbandry or remove human presence from half the earth. And in so doing, environmental activists slip easily into nostalgia for the past without necessarily coming to grips with the negative things that happened in the past. So environmental humanities as a discipline, I believe, is well situated to get beneath this nostalgic impulse to the nuance of past relations between human and non-human. Now, whether we as scholars work with archaeological records or literary works or historical records, artistic works, oral traditions, spatial patterns, belief systems, or media, we are all, in fact, dealing with remnants of the past. They were things that were made before this moment in time. And the goal of studying these remnants is not to understand how people were in the past, but rather why we are the way we are now. All of the environmental issues facing us today, climate change, plastics in the ocean, radioactive waste, land and water pollution, species extinction, they exist only in the forms they do because of the past. And they will continue to exist into the future without insights into how and why they came to be and how it could be otherwise. So in a world which over and over again stresses the potential of science and technology to, save our, to solve our environmental problems and save us, and I'll note here that I actually was an engineer, it was my first training, and worked in environmental engineering, for several years before going back as a historian. So I have a love for engineers. Um, but in this world, humanistic inquiry is needed more than ever to embed science and technology into its social, cultural, political, economic, and ethical context. But in order to be effective doing that, environmental hum huma humanists need to not fall into the nostalgia trap. We need to recognize and embrace change, 
as a potential way to make the past relevant to the future. So what kind of change am I talking about? Well, I want to propose three areas in which environmental humanities have already begun and I believe need to continue to embrace the new. New narrators of nature, new neighbors in nature, and new experiences of nature. New narrators of nature. So what counts as the right nature that we should preserve or restore? The nostalgic impulses to preserve are always dependent upon a particular point of view. And in the history of environmentalism, these sentiments exist within the long history of colonialism. Attempts at transforming landscapes understood by the center as peripheral have a long history from the great colonial projects of the 19th century up to present conflicts over resource extraction and access to land in the global south. <coughs> Post-colonial studies have stressed that power relations and the ideas of other have fundamentally shaped these colonizer-colonized relationships. The fundamental assumption of the center is often that local inhabitants elsewhere are underusing or misusing their resources, including wildlife, and landscapes. So from the beginning of things like the National Park Movement, the idea was to preserve nature overruling local use. These are uneven relationships. These are institutions of power. And modern environmentalism is heavily driven by middle, upper, class urban whites who impose their ideas on others. So let me give you an example of this practice from my own research. And I'm going to use examples, and they're all from things I've done. And you'll see that diversity <laughs> of things. So in 1971, a small herd of muskoxen crossed the border from Norway into Sweden. Now, muskox had been in Sweden thousands of years ago. But these animals that came over in 1971 were from individuals that had been brought from Greenland to Norway in the 1950s. So these were the first musk, musk oxen in Sweden within historical times. And there was a question about whether or not they should be allowed to stay. So five years after they first showed up in Hariadalen, there was a joint consultation meeting held to bring together oops, the major stakeholders in the area. And the Sami villages in Hariadalen and Jampland voiced strong objections to the muskox presence as they had experienced it over the previous five years. So their representative noted that searches by plane and snow scooter and foot for muskox disturbed the reindeer herds. The animals themselves, so the muskox, were damaging cabins and fenced-in areas. And if an animal was around, you really couldn't go into the cabin because muskox will charge you. They're rather, yeah, large. They're in the goat family, not actually an ox, but they do have big horns. Now, some muskox were grazing within reindeer flocks, so they really couldn't gather up the reindeer when they needed to. And there was concern that they would attack uh, dogs that are used in herding. And that is actually what muskox attack more than anything else is, is dogs, being the descendants of their only natural predator, which is wolves. So after listening to these objections in the course of this consultation, the response from the other persons in the room was, well, musk oxen are a natural protection object. This is an environmental sentiment that they're wildlife that we should have in Sweden. That they had the potential to bring tourism money because people would go on safaris to see musk ox. You can actually go to Dovra um, in Norway, Dovra National Park, and go on musk ox safaris today. You can also go to Tannas uh, here in Sweden and see the muskox farm. So there's some potential for tourism. And that, well, they really weren't any more dangerous than other things like elk, moose. Right? 
So when the Swedish EPA sent a draft policy out for comments in 1978 based on this consultation, the comments that they got back from the local people, the people actually living where the muskox were going to be, were definitively negative. All of them, the county of Jampelen, the, the agricultural board, the local Sami village, they all wanted strict limits on how many animals there could be, and they wanted compensation for any damages. But if we look at the policy that was finalized after these comments were all gathered, none of those things made it into the policy. The limit was much higher than the 20 asked for. They talk about two complete herds, which could be anywhere up to about 80 animals. Um, no special compensation package was included, and it was recommended that the muskox be added as a protected species, meaning you couldn't kill it. So what happened? Well, the Swedish herders of reindeer had expressed their negative views on the muskox, but they were intentionally ignored. The government officials in the center decided that muskox as a nature protection object was more important than local use of the land. And what I would argue from this as an example is that as long as this kind of policy, and rewilding is one of those kinds of policy, comes from academics and government entities centered in the urban space and NGOs, other non-resident actors, it always behaves in these kind of colonial fashions. So to be decolonized, you have to have local narrators. You need the local narrators and their stories, and they need to be respected. Now, environmental humanities as a field has come to recognize that we need to give space to voices that have been ignored. As Elizabeth DeLowry, Jill Dodor, and Anthony Kerrigan have argued, mainstream environmental narratives need to be critiqued to draw, quote, attention to the power relations and structural inequalities that they all too frequently occlude. There is no single idea of what right nature is. Therefore, we need to take seriously alternative positions. Now, there are also many voices who discuss environmental issues without overtly screaming, I'm interested in the environment. So when eco-critical studies, for example, eco-critical studies of literature was starting out, scholars tended to focus on people considered to be nature writers. So studies of Ralph Waldo Emerson or Henry David Thoreau or, or texts considered to be environmentalists like Silent Spring or modern climate fiction. All texts that purport to be about the environment. But over the last few decades, what we see is more and more scholars examining literature that on face value is not about nature, but it still gives us insights about the human-non-human -human relationship. From bees in Shakespeare to do androids dream of electric sheep. So take, for example, in my own work, the very first episode of Star Trek, aired on television in 1966. In The Man Trap, a creature from the planet M113 begins to kill crewmen of the Enterprise. It turns out that it's the last of its kind. When the archaeologist Robert Crater, who'd been living on the planet, admits to knowing about this creature and its propensity to kill uh, for salt, he likens it to the American bison, the buffalo. So Crater says, she is the last of her kind, Kirk. The last of her kind? The last of its kind, Earth history, remember? Like the passenger pigeon or the buffalo. Then Spock comes in. The Earth buffalo, what about it? Once there were millions of them, prairies black with them. One herd covered three whole states, and when they were moved, they were like thunder. And now they're gone, that's what you mean? Like the creatures here, once there were millions of them, now there's one left. Now a fictional literary exchange like this can give us insights into how extinction was conceptualized in the 1960s. The passenger pigeon had become extinct in 1914, even though billions of pigeons 
had existed in North America when the Europeans arrived. Bison was almost hunted to extinction in the late 19th century, although a few number survived in privately owned herds and protected herds in the Western National Parks. This actually saved them from eradication. The near demise of the bison had become widely acknowledged as an environmental misstep by the turn of the century, and efforts to save bison were regularly lauded in popular magazines. So interestingly, the writers of Star Trek, envisioning a future in the 23rd century, argue that the fight to save the bison had in fact been lost and the animals were gone. In the end of the episode, the creature from planet 113 and 113 is killed. The species is extinct. In the last scene of the episode, when Spock asks, asks Captain Kirk if something was wrong, Kirk replies, I was thinking about the buffalo, Mr. Spock. Here's a voice that's from popular culture. It's not a mainstream environmental voice, yet it has an environmental message. So one of the tasks of environmental humanities now is to make space for these kind of narrators, to include them in our narratives, and to allow them to tell their environmental stories. The next new thing I think we should include, new neighbors. So one of the main trends in environmental humanities has been inclusivity of non-humans in our analysis. Scholars have broken down nature-culture dichotomies by revealing the complex relationships of people and other life, from cattle to crows, from mice to mushrooms. And these other life forms and their life worlds have been discussed as our kin and things we are becoming with. I don't object to the proposition that animals and plants are my kin, but I also want to propose that they are our neighbors. When Mr. Rogers, who has an American child I grew up watching on television, invited us to join him in daily adventure with his melodic, won't you be my neighbor, he was inviting us into a congenial, supportive, and loving environment. Mr. Rogers' neighborhood was the kind of place where you helped each other, comforted each other, and laughed together. Folks were neighborly. As humans have urbanized across the planet, other species have joined us in city living. From rats in the sewers, to birds at the feeders, to dogs in the park, to dandelions in the sidewalk cracks, we're surrounded by non-humans who cohabit the urban space with us. What would it mean to be neighborly with our non-human neighbors? At sunset every day from March to November, Thousands of human spectators gather in Austin, Texas to see the largest bat colony in the world come out for their night hunting, largest urban bat colony. Now this is not a cave that the bats come out of. Instead, they roost under the bridge beams of the Ann W. Richards Congress Avenue Bridge. A migratory Mexican free tail bat colony of over one million bats has come each year to the underside of this bridge since the mid-1980s to make their home and rear their young. The Congress Avenue Bridge has crossed the Colorado River in downtown Austin to connect the two sides of town since, the since 1910, but it was renovated in 1980, and the new design of the bridge added expansion joints which turned out to be the size that were perfect as nooks for bats. The bats began showing up to roost under the bridge in 1982. The bridge is located near urban lakes that have a significant flying insect population that serve as the bats' food. And in September 1984, newspapers carried articles about the several hundred thousand bats under bridges in the city. Four people, in fact, were bitten by bats, which is a major concern because they can't carry rabies. So all of those people had to have rabies shots. <clears throat> so some reactions to the bats living under the bridge were negative. 
And according to a city health administrator, the city government considered covering the expansion joints with wire screens or rubber to keep the bats from being there. But they decided against it because it might make the bats move to even less desirable places than there. For example, parking garages. So although the press coverage in 1984 was overwhelmingly negative, with headlines like, bat colonies sink teeth into city, a group from the Bat Conservation International uh, moved to Austin and worked to change public opinion about the bats. And in fact, it worked. The bats were rapidly adopted as a tourist attraction and even symbol of the city. By 1990, the bats were recognized by the city parks and recreation department as a nature attraction. They got educational displays along the river trail. The city approved the installation of artist Dale Whistler's kinetic metal sculpture of a stylized bat in 1998. And the annual Bat Fest, featuring live music, art and crafts vendors, and bat-themed activities on the bridge, started in 2004, and it's still a major annual event. And at dusk in summer, the spectators continue to gather to wish their neighbors good evening. So this is a story about accepting neighbors who've moved in and recognizing that they too have their own history and their own reasons for being there. Attributing agency where it's due has been a key concern in environmental humanities work and the Austin bats show us how important that is. The humans rebuilding Congress Avenue Bridge in no way intended to make good bat habitat. But the bats didn't know that. What the bats did know is that that bridge made a good home. So they moved in. How humans responded to that animal agency demonstrates whether we are good neighbors or bad ones. Finally, I want to turn to, oops, new experiences about nature. I should not say knowledge. <clears throat> uh, the modern experience of nature and what we know about nature is always technologically mediated. Even as something as simple as a walk through the woods, as I did this morning to get to campus, requires shoes on my feet, glances in front of my eyes. I know where to go at home. I didn't hear. So I may use paper maps, or as I did this morning, my digital GPS. I take out my mobile camera to capture moments I spy wildlife on the trail. This is the reality of the nature experience. And I would challenge environmental humanists to recognize this as new and yet authentic. There's not something less in the digital, but it is different. So if we take the case of the aquarium. So humans have been looking at fish for millennia. Fish ponds for aesthetics have been a common feature of ancient civilizations from Chinese ornamental water gardens to show off goldfish to Romans who've had saltwater and freshwater species. By the 10th century, Chinese aristocrat, uh, aristocrats would pay, place their prized goldfish into ceramic bowls in the house to show them off to guests before they took them back into the ponds. And throughout history, the mode of observation, observing fish was from the top. The viewer stands over the pond or the bowl and you look down on the fish. The only other way you could see fish was to dive into the water. The glass aquarium changed this mode of seeing. The ocean would be moved to eye level. Think of how dramatic that is. The glass terrarium, then known as the Wardian case, invented by Nathaniel Bagshaw Ward, in 1829 to seal off plants it was quickly adapted to aquatic environments and by 1850 articles started appearing on how to keep aquatic life alive in these cases without flowing water the fact that you just set water there you don't have electric pumps so take that out of your mind 
So the fish house at London Zoological Gardens opened its doors in 1853 as the first public aquarium. And Noel Humphreys, a contemporary commentator who wrote about this history of aquariums at the time, noted that these tanks gave visitors a glimpse of the wonders of the ocean floor. So the view, it reversed the land-based gaze. He wrote, on the land, we have as the ordinary aspect of nature, the green herbaceous mantle of the earth below the eye and azure sky above. While a spectator standing beneath the water on the ocean floor would see these features more reversed. He would see above him a liquid atmosphere of green and below an herbage of red and of purple hues exhibiting strange and exquisite forms such as no terrestrial vegetation displays. So here was something that the normal human cannot see. And yet now with the aquarium, you can. It changed your perspective. Yet everyone recognized there was a problem with glass aquariums and this particular mode of seeing. First, glass actually creates unequal refraction, which distorts the contents if the glass is thick. But the glass needs to be thick if it's going to be a large tank because water is very heavy and it'll break the glass. So not unexpectedly then people toyed with and thought about what are better materials you could make aquariums out of. It took 130 years to get there, but eventually they came to acrylic glass. Acrylic glass, transparent and hard, 17 times stronger than plate glass and it weighs half as much. It turned out to be the solution. 1984, the modern aquarium at Monterey Bay was under construction and they wanted to make a signature exhibit to display giant Pacific kelp, which is their kind of signature um, ecosystem. Now, giant kelp plants are extremely tall, reaching from the seafloor up to the surface. So what they needed was a really tall exhibit, but that wasn't possible with plate glass. So the designers decided to install acrylic plant panels, and acrylic had been used in other types of things, but not aquarium before this. So instead of thinking of glass as a horizontal at eye level, the new glass would extend the tank dramatically upward and this radically altered the relationship between the visitor and nature by placing the viewer under the water. Aquariums also quickly, very quickly, within five years after uh, Monterey Bay, adopted acrylic to create tunnels. All large modern aquariums have at least one tunnel. And these allowed a 3D underwater experience. As the author Lighton Taylor in his book, Aquariums, Windows to Nature, summarized in 1993, today's acrylic technology provides the next best thing to being wet. They make whole new ways of seeing underwater for the average person. It allows you to be underwater with no special breathing apparatus. Yet looking through the acrylic is not the same thing as being in the water. Although they try to make the material as non-distortive as possible, there's still a medium between the viewer and the viewed. The fish, sharks, and rays swimming behind the acrylic wall are in the same building as the viewer, yet they are physically separated in spite of the illusion of cohabiting their space. Now in the digital age, we've come one step further in the underwater nature experience. Now we don't even have to go to the aquarium to see the fish through the glass. Public aquariums have installed webcams in major tanks so that you and I can watch from the comfort of our homes. And scientific, like this one, at the uh, tropical reef habitat at the Aquarium of the Pacific. So I'm standing at the exhibit and I'm looking at the exhibit right now on the webcam. And scientific diving teams, like the NOAA's Okeanos Explorers send live camera feeds of their ocean ex exploration missions online, giving us views of places that not even human bodies go. In these nature experiences, we are true explorers. 
we can actually see species that may not even be described by science, as well as seeing the radical effects of humans in the ocean space, like the set of containers filled with household appliances that Okeana stumbled upon last year. And I was watching this broadcast when that happened. They were just as surprised as everybody else. What is this? Um, and there's a whole group of containers that had obviously fallen off of a ship. Now these new experiences of nature through the screen, like through the glass, are not less authentic than seeing a fish in the water. In fact, with today's incredible camera technology, that little squat lobster is so small. And then when they zoom out, you see how far away their camera is. You have opportunity to be closer than you ever could have before. But the experience is different than what it was. These are new experiences that need to be thought about and understood in order to move them to their full potential as vehicles for environmental awareness and environmental becoming. So at the beginning of this talk, I said that we're in a period of rapid change on the planet. We're also in a period of rapid change for the environmental humanities. In a very short period of time, We've seen the establishment of journals, such as the Environmental Humanities in 2002, Resilience, a journal of the, for the Environmental Humanities in 2004. We've seen book series, like Routledge's Environmental Humanities series started in 2014, and Brill's Studies in Environmental Humanities of the same year. We've seen a host of state-of-the-field books, like the Environmental Humanities, a Critical Introduction from 2017, and the Routledge Companion to the Environmental Humanities, also last year. In the Nordic countries, there are a slew of environmental humanities centers and groups that have been started, including Environmental Humanities Lab at Kotehō, the Seed Box here at Tenshopping. Um, I'm going next week to the Center for Environmental Humanities at Aarhus University, my own greenhouse, the University of Stavanger. So there's been rapid institutional change. But of course, where do we go from here? I would argue that we need to not just produce more stories for the environment, but stories that are qualitatively different. Now is the time for environmental humanities to embrace the new, the new narrators of nature, the new neighbors in our lives, the new experiences of the digital world. We need to recognize these as valuable and valued. We need to make room for these new natures in the environmental humanities. Now embracing the new does not mean throwing out the past, because the past is never just past. It's also our future, because the future depends on the past. This means thinking beyond the past as something to be preserved, and rather something that lives on in present hybrid forms, sometimes unruly, and often not where we would expect to find them. So to return to Lowenthal, to know is to care, to care is to use, and to use is to transform the past. And what I would argue in relationship to the theme of citizen humanities, that knowing, caring, and using are actions of environmental citizenship. That environmental citizenship is what we should be aiming for. How do we create people who both know and then care and then use those things? Because that's what citizens do. They both know about their responsibilities and their opportunities and they're willing to do something about it. So we need to not just store away the seeds of the past in a vault in case of the cataclysm. Instead, we need to plant the seeds and we need to till the fields and we need to reap the harvest. Thank you. <laughs>